folks, my name's Peter. I'm a church minister in a place called Burghead. I've been asked to give some thoughts on church in this strange post-pandemic world we're in now. It's certainly true that the COVID pandemic has shaped and changed and disrupted all of our usual patterns and rhythms of life. I read somewhere that it forms about 60 days to, to, to form a lasting habit. And of course, we've had way longer than that in this strange and disrupted season. I reckon that we'll, we'll look back in generations to come on the pandemic as an event that's really radically changed culture and society, maybe for good and for ill. Who knows? But it's certainly changed and disrupted the patterns of church life. Most especially, most obviously, that act of gathering together as a church family to worship God, to hear his word taught, to encourage one another. For large uh, stretches of time, we weren't able to do that, not in person at least. And that means all of those rhythms and patterns have been disturbed and disrupted. And some Christians have not yet returned to in-person church. Some are asking, do we even need to? And as a result, um, attendance at churches is looking like it has reduced and reduced significantly. I, I saw one uh, study from uh, the UK that suggested there had been a 30% drop in church attendance. It also suggested that for those who had returned, um, their commitment to being with their church family week upon week had significantly weakened. Of course, there's the technology question as well. The church has had to get online and do live streams and all the rest uh, during the COVID pandemic. We certainly did in our church family, and, and that was really useful. But now the questions come, well, is online church church? Can't I just stay at home? No matter how comfortable my church chairs are, my sofa's pretty nice. Can't I just stay at home? Well, to help us grapple with these questions, I want to read... A short and very well-known passage of scripture. It's from the book of Hebrews and it speaks to exactly this subject. So Hebrews chapter 10 and from verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The big picture here is that the writer to the Hebrews has been showing them how Jesus and his gospel is better, better than they think, better than perhaps they've realised, better than all the, the types and patterns and shadows in the Old Testament that really just point to Jesus, who is our great sacrifice, uh, who brings us the forgiveness of sins and our great high priest who brings us to God. And he says, since all of that's the case, here's three things we've got to do, three commandments. And the first one, verse 22, is let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and the full assurance that faith brings. That's the first thing we've got to do, draw near to God. Now, it's possible he's talking about the act of, of drawing near to God for the first time. In other words, that act of, of repentance and faith, of, of putting our trust in Jesus. But more likely, given that so much of this letter has been about uh, the temple and the Old Testament uh, system of, of sacrifice and worship, it's more likely, he means, that we need to draw near to God together, as we do when we gather to worship him. And he says that we can do that with full assurance. We can come to God in worship and in praise 
we can come to him knowing that he accepts us as his children because of all that Jesus has done. The second command, verse 23, is let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Hebrews is shot through with this truth that it isn't enough just to turn to Christ. A, a, a briefly muttered sinner's prayer is not the Christian life. The Christian life is an ongoing life of repentance and faith and repentance and faith, an ongoing life of holding on to Jesus and to the hope he gives us in the gospel. Hebrews has repeated warnings about the danger of drift, the danger, if you like, of, get, of getting uh, comfortable and casual in the Christian life. The danger of neglecting to be devoted to God. There is a serious danger of drift. Now, of course, we know it's true that all those who truly belong to Christ, chosen by God, saved by God, he will keep them. In the end, it's true that, that God has a hold of us much more than we have a hold of him, if we are his people. But Hebrews is clear that, that one mark, one sign that we really do belong to God is that we'll heed the warnings of a book like Hebrews, where we are repeatedly warned to hold on tightly to the hope we have in Jesus, not to be casual in our spiritual journey. And of course, we should be mindful of uh, the parable of the sower or the soils that Jesus taught. Yes, some seed fell on the stony ground and came to nothing. Other seed fell on good soil and produced a crop that is of repentance and faith and of, of a life lived for Jesus. But other seed fell on soil where there seemed to be growth at first. There seemed to be interest in Christ. There seemed even to be new life in Christ. And yet ultimately that new life in Christ came to nothing. It became clear in the end that there wasn't ever really real repentance and faith there. Hebrews says, beware of that danger of the cares of the world and the worries of life. And as Jesus says, the deceitfulness of wealth getting in and crowding us out from hope and faith and trust, single minded trust in Jesus. There's a need to hold on to our faith. And then the final command, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. See, the Christian life is never just about me and God or you and God. Of course, that's key. But as we come to know God as our father, we always also come to know our fellow believers as brothers and sisters. It's an echo there of what Jesus said about the, the greatest commandments, to love God and to love neighbour. Likewise, if we know Christ, the head of the body that is the church, well, we'll know and love and care for the other members of the body. However you put it, the Christian life is always about you and God, yes, but it's also about you and the world, you and God. Loving the world, sharing the gospel with the world. But more than that, it's about you and your fellow brothers and sisters in the church. And so put simply, here are three commands to draw near to God together in worship. To hold unswervingly onto the hope of the gospel, lest we drift away. And to consider how we might spur each other on in the faith. And by the way, earlier on in Hebrews, you know, the, the, the only other time, as far as I'm aware, that the writer uses that consider word, he says, consider Jesus. Now, of course, we, we expect that, don't we? we? We'd be unsurprised to hear uh, the authors of the New Testament encouraging us to consider Jesus. But the author uses the same word to say, yes, consider Jesus, but also consider your church family, how you can spur them on towards love and good deeds. So draw near to God together. Hold unswervingly onto the hope and consider each other in the church family. And the real 
punch, the sucker punch at the end of this passage comes there when he says, verse 25, not giving up meeting together. That is meeting together in the flesh, in person. And the reason for that is pretty simple. The writer has built his case because all three of these things, drawing near to God in worship together, holding unswervingly onto hope together, spurring each other on, none of these three things can be properly done in isolation, on our own, or through a live stream. During the pandemic, when we had no other choice, of course, we did our best. And live streams were much, much better than nothing. And yes, they opened up new opportunities for the gospel. And we thank God for that. And we shouldn't be anti-technology or anything like that. But the fact is, drawing near to God, holding on to the gospel, and considering how we can help each other in the Christian life. These things must be done together if they're to be done properly. The fact is, as we hold on to Jesus, we can't do it alone. We need each other. God in his wisdom has given us the gift of the church. And even if you feel, well, I'm all right on a Sunday morning, I quite like it at home. I'm comfy on my sofa. Can you see that you have missed this huge, important New Testament idea and command that that you are to gather with the body of Christ, not just for what you get in terms of blessing and Bible teaching and, and all the rest of it, but for what you give to others. Your very presence in person is an encouragement to believers who may work in a workplace where They're the only Christian or or go to a school where they're the only Christian. Do you see? The commands are clear. Draw near to God together. Hold unswervingly onto the hope of the gospel. And we need each other to do that. And consider carefully how we can help one another. Spur each other on in the Christian life. And none of these things can be done through a live stream. In fact, in the end, when all is said and done, the world of the live stream is a consumer world. It's kind of comfortable. We take what we want. Perhaps we'll be blessed by it. But the New Testament vision of the church is by no means a consumer vision. Sometimes we want to stay at home because it's easier. Frankly, if we're honest, because it it keeps us away from other people in the church who we might find difficult to relate to. But of course, even then, we're starving ourselves of one of the greatest opportunities for discipleship in our own lives. God has placed us in church families, partly so that we will learn and grow together. We will be matured by rubbing alongside people we don't always find easy. That is part of this growth of discipleship. So, friends, Livestream Church was better than nothing during a pandemic. I'm convinced that live streams were a great help at one point. I'm now concerned that live streams are a great hindrance uh, to the full work of the church, to the discipleship of its members, and as we grow in faith together. So let me encourage you, if you have a Bible teaching church nearby, go to it, join it, belong to it, love it, get behind it, and meet with it as often as you can in person.